welcome everyone to the third webinar in the 2019 NEMA IoT Now webinar series. Thank you all for joining us today. We will be starting shortly. Thank you for standing by. Welcome everyone to the third webinar in the 2019 NEMA IoT Now webinar series, exploring the risk and opportunities of the Internet of Things. My name is Muhammad Ali, and I'm the NEMA Program Manager for Building Infrastructure Division at National Electrical Manufacturers Association, NEMA, the Association of Electrical Equipment and Medical Imaging Manufacturers. I'm your moderator for the webinar today, and today's webinar topic is on DC microgrids in buildings. So some housekeeping item before we get started. Uh, the webinar today is being recorded for future playback. It will be available on NEMA's website, www.iotnowwebinars.org. Uh, for any questions or technical assistance throughout the webinar, please use the chat window located on the left-hand side of your control panel. Questions will be addressed later in the webinar during our live Q&A session. Right. I'm now going to play a short video about NEMA. The National Electrical Manufacturers Association has united America's electro industry. Through the collective strength of our member companies and the breadth of their industry expertise. Together we have created a vision that is carrying electrical manufacturers and the medical imaging industry into the future. We are committed to promoting practices that expand market opportunities, remove business barriers, and reduce manufacturing costs. Together, we play a vital role in the U.S. economy, generating more than $100 billion in shipments every year. With great pride, NEMA represents individual product sectors, from power transmission and distribution equipment, lighting systems, factory automation and control systems, to medical diagnostic imaging systems. Our members sustain 400,000 American manufacturing jobs operating in 7,000 locations across all 50 states. We are business leaders, electrical experts, engineers, scientists, and technicians. We employ talented people who make the products that are essential to the American way of life. We are the voice of the electro industry that commands the attention of policymakers and regulators and we are the source of the strength of electrical manufacturing today. We are NEMA. So one of our 2018 strategic initiatives was a webinar series on emerging trends in IoT, which was very successful. We also have a NEMA compilation report available on our website free of charge based upon the information presented during that IoT Now webinar series. By popular demand, NEMA is bringing more IoT Now webinars this year once a quarter. The NEMA Strategic Initiative Program was created to see emerging market opportunities and solve impending challenges facing multiple NEMA product divisions. For more information about the NEMA Strategic Initiative Program and to find out how to get involved, please visit our website at www.nema.org. Throughout this year, NEMA will cover important topics such as industrial IoT connectivity in 3.5 gigahertz CBRS band, digital twin, DC microgrids, which is the topic for, to for webinar today, and electromagnetic compatibility. For more information on the NEMA IoT Now webinar series, please visit our website at www.iotnowwebinars.org. I would now like to introduce our presenters for today. Our first presenter is Brian Patterson, president of Emerge Alliance. The Emerge Alliance is an open membership-based non-for-profit industry association formed in 2008 to create and promote the adoption of new standards for direct current power distribution within commercial buildings, 
to improve their flexibility and sustainability. Patterson's extensive technical and work history in building technologies, electronics, and fiber optics has resulted in his holding multiple patents in those fields. He's a founding member of the eMERGE Alliance and a member of IEEE, IEC, CABA, PSMA, SEPA, USGBC, and PHIUS, and an active participant in UL, NEMA, NFPA task groups on DC power. He's the eMERGE liaison to NEMA, UL, Solar Energy Industry Association, the NSF sponsored Center for Power Electronics Systems at the University of Virginia Technology, the Freedom System Center at the University of North Carolina, the Power Electronic Research Group at the University of Texas, Austin, and the Alliance to Save Energy. Our second presenter today is Paul Savage. He is the CEO of Next Tech Power Systems. Next Tech Power System is a Detroit-based tech company dedicated to providing others with the power to save energy. Next Tech Power Systems leverage high-efficiency high power converters and smart controls to optimize energy usage while drawing powers from renewables, batteries, and the grid. Next Tech technology reduces lighting ROIs and improves control functionality. Next Tech is the only solution for powering LEDs. Paul Savage is a CEO of Next Tech Power Systems, a graduate of Howard Ford College. Paul has a background in finance at the First Boston Corporation, Center Fitzgerald Corporation, and Lemon Brothers. He also served as a director of marketing and customer finance for VTrack Infrastructure Development Company as one of the founding senior members for the Caterpillar dealership in Vietnam. At Caterpillar, Paul helped grow the startup to 87 employees, five offices, and $22 million in sales in two years. Paul is the current chair and the founding governor, governing member of the eMERGE Alliance and a member of the advisory board of the Renewable Energy and, and International Law Project. Now, without further ado, I would like to hand the presentation over to our first presenter today, Brian. Thank you, Ali. Um, <clears throat> I was on the mute button there for a second. <laughs> In any case, um, Ali, the... Um, the current uh, situation regarding power, um, kind of around the world, but in particular here in North America, uh, is that the human populations are, are starting to move around and there's going to be a great deal of urbanization. And uh, on top of that uh, is this trend towards electrification of, of just about everything in our lives, uh, including personal, commercial, and public transportation. And with this, of course, comes a, a, a great deal of pressure on regional and national power grids. Um, so many people are, are kind of turning to uh, look at localized electricity production as well as management, and, and in particular in buildings, uh, because this seems to uh, start to suggest that we solve some of these uh, impending uh, uh, problems. Um, on top of that, of course, is the fact that we're moving into this uh, fully digital world. Um, so the, the c combination of some old technology and some new technology, um, similar to the way the, the information world was transformed with the, uh, with the uh, Internet and all of the digital uh, information technologies around the, around the uh, world today. Um, the uh, history, though, is, is interesting to look at as a, as a guide, perhaps, to what the uh, future solutions might be. Um, and when we look at the history, um, we find out that um, rural, the Rural Electrification Act of uh, 1936, which is part of the FDI, FDR administration's New Deal, um, really changed and transformed the electrical world. Uh, but prior to that time, uh, and actually prior to 1950, about 90 percent of America was supplied with uh, electricity from the grid um, while, the other, while the rest of the uh, country was supplied electricity off of what we now call microgrids. Um, the interesting fact is that those microgrids of all, uh, in rural America eventually disappeared because they were never interconnected in any kind of a network like the uh, AC was in, in the grid. Um, of course, we, we marvel at the grid uh, today uh, in the sense that it uh, is one of the largest machines and perhaps um, the greatest ma uh, machine uh, ever developed in the world. Um, but be that as it may, 
um, the grid took care of all of our electrical needs for uh, darn near 100 years, at least 75 years. And that meant that uh, the rest of us could go to sleep while a, a, a relatively small uh, cadre of people took care of all of our electrical needs um, uh, as we went along. But more recently, um, we've actually run into some, some issues. Um, <clears throat> the uh, infrastructure that we have is a bit cumbersome um, and imposing. And uh, with the increase in electricity, particularly as forecasted to be needed for uh, the electrification of transportation and uh, continuing electrification of our digital world, uh, that presents a problem. We also have had an overdependency on fossil fuels. And although there have been some improvements with a greater use of natural gas and, and to a certain extent, nuclear uh, uh, energy, uh, still there are many um, basic fossil fuel plants that are operating uh, today in the majority. And as I mentioned, the infrastructure required to grow this system um, is a, a bit imposing, and there's a lot of resistance to doing that, uh, expanding transmission lines or underground uh, uh, pipelines, et cetera. And last but not least, and probably the one that's most talked about, is the uh, influence of, uh, of resiliency, or lack thereof. And whether it's man-caused or natural, um, this poses additional problems, of course, uh, for the grid. Um, so we've been having these issues, and uh, with the grid being built uh, over, you know, 100 years ago, in start, at least started 100 years ago, you know, our, our grid operators have been um, pretty good at maintaining uh, power for us, but, uh, but the data suggests that that's not going to continue, and in fact, um, power outages and the implications of power outages are a growing and uh, maybe even considered major concern. But if we're going to solve this problem, um, we, we may need to use some new thinking, or at least some uh, barred and, and, and old thinking as combined with some new thinking, um, because we're not just simply going to be able to put Band-Aids on the uh, technology that we've used for the last 100 years and expect to have a, a, a new result. Um, so the one notion that's uh, gaining uh, a lot of popularity and a lot of attention, I was just looking at the number of hits on the uh, Internet for uh, the term microgrid, and it's... Uh, it's absolutely exploding. Um, we, the notion here is to couple these uh, AC macro grid that we've had, that we've operated and invested in over the last 75 or so years, and couple it together with some of the concepts around microgrids. And more and more, we discover that an easy way to integrate resources in a microgrid is to use DC power and couple the elements with DC to eliminate the, the um, uh, extensive uh, electronics that are required for synchronization and uh, frequency control and, and things like that. So fortunately, we have a lot of new technology to, to accomplish that. So if we take the existing grid, add some smarts to it, particularly in terms of preventing linear dynamic failures or rolling blackout, uh, uh, blackouts that, uh, that occur, and combine it with some technology at the local level, the building level, in particular in microgrids, and, and most notably DC-coupled microgrids, we really have something that uh, uh, really shows some promise for the future. Uh, it gives us not only an environmentally uh, more favorable uh, approach to energy and electricity in particular, but also one that shows uh, now improving and increasing uh, economic viability, maybe to the point where in many cases uh, microgrids have reached uh, grid parity in terms of cost. Um, so if we do that, it, it, looks that we, it looks to be that we would end up with a more sustainable kind of grid of grids, um, or as some people would call it, a mesh network. Um, the idea here is very much like we experienced in computing, um, where we had personal computers that got coupled together in local area networks and ultimately in wide area networks and, and metro area networks all the way up to the Internet. Um, the notion is to kind of look at doing the same with power. And that is start with power uh, generation, uh, storage, and loads, and uh, such in buildings or at the building level, at the, tier, the first tier of this uh, grid of grids, and then slowly integrate it up into um, networks that would be like neighborhood networks and then community networks, regional networks, and on up to the, uh, uh, to the macro uh, power system, the, the so-called grid. So, 
The good news is this isn't a thought process at this point. It's actually something that's happening. It's, under, it's underway, although not everybody has uh, seen all of the uh, um, indications of it yet. Um, we are definitely in an evolution, at least an evolutionary process, to get this uh, grid of grids underway. Um, some would say that uh, it's, it's accelerating and therefore it's going to really turn into a kind of a revolutionary thing, much the way personal computing got into the, the Internet or uh, uh, cell phones took over the telephony uh, 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 domain. Uh, in any case, um, the idea here and where the building comes into such significant importance is that it really is the basis for this new uh, network or mesh network of power. Um, so much like we fought over back in the day uh, about the dumb terminals and smart terminals with information and computing, um, the idea of having uh, intelligence at the terminal, or in this case at the building, that can assist in the um, uh, not only generation, collection, and use of uh, technology, but also the sharing of it uh, throughout the network is probably uh, a concept that we should pay a lot of attention to at this point. So as the grid is getting smarter, and DC coupled microgrids are evolving more and more um, uh, to uh, uh, be distributed at building level, um, we're, we're making progress. Uh, just a quick look at how that all comes together, and that is to look at what's involved in a microgrid very briefly, and these are microgrids that will start at building levels that Paul's going to talk about in a few seconds here. Um, you have local sources of energy, some of which you'll harvest right out of the local environment, energy storage, which buffers that power so that it doesn't have to be disp instantaneously dispatchable like uh, rotary generators have to be uh, uh, engaged. Um, you have a management, and that's the intelligence and part of what ties into the whole IoT world. Uh, and then there's uh, a way of utilizing that uh, power in new ways, and, and Paul's going to talk a lot about that, and uh, down onto the, the, the types of loads and the change in the types of loads that are occurring. So a lot, the way this evolution started was that people started tying in PV arrays and solar into power systems and then converting it to AC power and just delivering it to the local loads. Um, along came some feedback capability so you could actually feed it back to the, to the uh, grid if you synchronized it properly and you agreed to the terms of the grid operator. Um, found out really that that only uh, solved part of the problem of uh, local generation because it isn't dispatchable power. So what do you do when you have critical loads and you want to have a ready uh, uh, standby or contributory power? Um, you had to engage storage. And fortunately, that uh, evolution of, of technology is, is rapidly taking place and, and costs are coming down uh, quickly. Um, then on to looking at, well, once you have uh, DC, natively DC power generation and natively DC power storage, can you feed that power directly to natively DC loads, particularly IT equipment, IoT equipment, um, and other, other loads that more and more are moving from AC, natively AC apparatus to DC, although in most AC apparatus or in most equipment today we have power supplies that do the conversion, but that's a conversion that has to take place at every uh, piece of equipment and adds complexity and cost to the equipment as a result. Um, there's a growing array of sourcing of power uh, beyond solar and wind, uh, geothermal, uh, 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 electrothermal, uh, there's fuel cell technology, combined heat and power technologies really make sense where, where you have a uh, use for the heat. Um, uh, and, and by mixing those together you get a lot of complementary results in terms of cost uh, uh, savings and uh, uh, peak shaving and uh, uh, ramp ups and, and uh, black starts and things that really make sense in terms of both operational strategy as well as cost. Um, to fully IoT integrate all of this equipment is the key um, and that's where the whole IoT world comes into this um, in the sense that every piece of equipment then can communicate uh, and whether at a peer level or through a, 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 a hierarchical control system. Um, and there are yet more things to come in this whole world of uh, uh, local power and distributed uh, renewable power and such. And one of those things is something called digital DC or digital electricity. Um, and I think uh, perhaps Paul will touch on that. 
The end game, though, is to create this grid of grids, which is really a mesh network uh, in buildings uh, that it then extends out to campuses, communities, neighborhoods, as I mentioned, all the way up uh, to a full-blown grid of grids implementation. So the attributes that we would see there that are going to change from what exists today in our power system, and you can see this mirrored in what happened in the information world, just like most information now is created at the fringe of the Internet, most power will be generated at the fringe, meaning in buildings or around buildings. New generation storage and loads are natively DC, so that means a greater use, a greater attention needs to be paid to DC because it does provide non-synchronous DC coupling at the local level, which minimizes the, the whole disruptive impact of distributed resource integration into the AC uh, grid that we have. Um, it, in uh, uh, configuring this in a kind of a mesh topology allows us to, for it to be self-healing and self-configuring, which means it can avoid the kind of linear, dynamic, hard-connected failures that you see today in the AC system uh, as it currently sits without support. Um, also, this uh, notion of semi-autonomous distributed control uh, supports the notion that we could have this kind of tiered transactional uh, management structure that involves uh, layers of, of grids and the grid of grids and uh, also enables a whole new uh, set of business conditions which, uh, among other things, will enable uh, something called energy as a service, which is a way of differentiating energy not just on a cost per kilowatt but on a cost of a kilowatt over time at a certain quality level at a certain place. So that's going to change the uh, whole business world. But I'm going to turn it over to Paul to give uh, uh, his uh, look at uh, what's happening literally in buildings and, and in particular with DC microgrids. Paul? Yeah, thanks, Brian. I wanted to uh, share with the group an uh, overview about the, the state of DC microgrids in the commercial market today, giving some examples about the loads they support and um, the loads that are on deck to be supported. I think it's uh, fair to say uh, that uh, there are some great examples now uh, in the marketplace where uh, there were very few before uh, here in the U.S. Uh, that's a picture uh, on the upper right-hand corner of the American Geophysical Union, the um, um, organization for natural scientists uh, headquartered in Washington, D.C. They've done a wonderful job of uh, blogging their building, uh, building.agu.org, if you'd like to look at it. And it shows their uh, work to produce a net zero energy building uh, retrofit in an urban area. Uh, we believe it's the first one of its kind in Washington, and it's uh, fascinating if you're in the neighborhood. They're very uh, proud of what they've done. And part of that is a, a DC bus architecture for the building that allows uh, uh, on-site uh, power to be integrated into the uh, building loads, which they have uh, unmasked uh, lighting controls and the, uh, the outlets at the workstations for the staff. Fascinating example. Below that is a uh, manufacturing facility out in the Midwest. Uh, we did a couple hundred thousand square feet with a 380-volt uh, DC bus that is powering uh, DC lighting uh, direct. Uh, so they're avoiding those uh, conversion losses. And as we'll see, lighting really abounds as the uh, first uh, point of major market uptake, but it's not the only one. I would like to take a minute. This is something Brian uh, touched on kind of implied, but it's sort of hard to see, uh, and that is how the nature of these uh, DC microgrids and buildings actually uh, lower the necessary infrastructure uh, to support the building as load. So in this example, you see, uh, imagine 100% a, a of a regular building and its need for AC circuits to support what's going on inside. And uh, imagine, as we've uh, demonstrated, you could, you could look-see, you wouldn't have to imagine, that you can actually reduce the number of AC circuits required to uh, support the equivalent amount 
of uh, lighting in the building. So you'd have the, you'd have the equivalent uh, foot candles on the floor, but you actually get to reduce the number of circuits needed to support those uh, DC systems. And this is in large part because of the uh, uh, development, maybe maturation of the LED light source, um, but also the uh, direct current nature of that light source, uh, which allows you to put in a power infrastructure to support it in a more modular fashion instead of in the uh, AC model uh, having to uh, really put in more capacity uh, than you're uh, designed to today. Now, likewise, we see the same reduction in, in uh, AC circuits required for direct current outlets. Uh, unlike the uh, USB ports you might have seen at the airport that are nestled in uh, with, uh, within an AC receptacle, um, those are a product of a local conversion of AC to DC, these DC networks and buildings are now uh, running all the way to the uh, plug and we've seen now class two outlets that can go into a, a building uh, with a lower capacity than an AC outlet, about half capacity, but it turns out that's uh, better suited better suited to uh, the load and how it's been changing. Yeah, an example of that. Uh, first, even uh, farther back, to stand farther back from the model, and this uh, 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 furthers Brian's comments about uh, the synchronous system versus the asynchronous system that direct current represents. If you uh, look at that top chart, thanks to our friends at the uh, uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you'll see uh, what's commonly understood as um, what utilities need to plan for in their uh, load model, which is covering the peak. Uh, and in designing their system to cover that peak, they wind up, as you can see, with uh, a lot of capacity that's unused uh, in the uh, greater number of off-peak hours in the system. We've overcome that with a regulated utility market that uh, provides incentives for the utility to build uh, in excess of that peak, but it still, at the end of the day, represents an inefficiency. So consider that uh, graph in your mind as you wander down to the bottom of the page, which is uh, uh, from a battery energy storage uh, system provider showing uh, how having integrated storage uh, near the load and indeed solar, not, not coincidental that both of those are inherently direct current devices, batteries store and discharge it, uh, solar panels um, inherently produce it. And you can see that instead of uh, reaching up to cover that capacity required in a synchronous model like we have at the top. Uh, instead, the DC platform uh, allows the power uh, sharing to occur closer to the load, uh, letting us fit better the load to the source. Now I'm going to whipsaw you going all the way from the largest macro view of the utility to what's going on at your outlet. Uh, this could be your outlet uh, in your kitchen, uh, but instead it's my mother-in-law's outlet in her kitchen. And I was interested to see that of the two, four, five plugs uh, that are plugged into that uh, duplex outlet, they're only supporting 40 watts of load. So you've got uh, lights with LED uh, bulbs in them, you've got a battery charger, you've got a clock radio. And all those things together amount to 40 watts. But, but what did the designer of that receptacle uh, call for in uh, the infrastructure needed for its support? Well, it's about 180 watts of capacity for every uh, duplex outlet. Um, and yet, when you look at all of the uh, plugs trying to get a piece of the action there from the outlet, uh, it is, in fact, 78% under loaded in terms of the receptacle's capacity. So why do we have this mismatch? Well, there, there are a number of reasons, but the largest one is the uh, increased efficiency 
that we've been seeing in all of our devices. Uh, maybe when the uh, code first anticipated the need and use of receptacles, uh, wall receptacles, uh, maybe they were planning on uh, standing lamps of uh, uh, 60 or, or, or 100 watts. But it's just not what's out there today. And indeed, all of the loads that surround us have been shrinking. Uh, but by and large, our electrical infrastructure has not. Until now, that's a picture of a DC outlet, uh, which as I described before, is uh, being connected to uh, a DC bus in the building. And so you're able to get uh, all the benefits of, uh, of the interoperability of that bus all the way down to your plug loads. And I don't know if you can see, this is a prototype we made with a clear faceplate so people could get a look at what's inside, which I think is a little hard to do. Uh, but up top, there is a, a USB-C connector. A USB-C, you're probably aware, uh, can deliver up to 96 watts of power uh, through that uh, small connector, which is uh, 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 smaller in dimension than the two connectors below it, USB-C-A connectors. We're all familiar with as uh, how we charge our, our phones. And uh, that connector is shrunk. Uh, it's gone from uh, something um, that is easily, easily seen there to something smaller, and yet the power uh, delivery capability has uh, grown. Also, intelligence. Uh, they now can provide uh, full broadband connectivity in addition to the 96 watts of power in that USB-C uh, connector, which has really changed the game for what's available in your wall socket. So after that uh, quick trip to the utility level all the way down to the plug, I'd like to uh, just reflect a little bit on uh, the main load that DC has uh, infiltra infiltrated as a, uh, a supported load, and that is uh, lighting, lighting and control systems. Uh, I guess it's been five or six years now that the LED market has really completely taken over the fluorescent uh, light source market in the commercial industrial space and in many of our homes. Uh, some states have uh, already ruled, <coughs> pardon me, the uh, incandescent lamp illegal, uh, but certainly many people are finding even fluorescent is uh, less convenient than the LED uh, lamps. All of these uh, pictures are showing you commercial office buildings, uh, manufacturing plants, there's a uh, truck depot, uh, class A office space, there's a hospital, uh, a medical clinic, uh, and a, uh, uh, there on the lower right, that's uh, one of the uh, temporary office space uh, companies which has been growing so quickly. Uh, all of these applications have a uh, great use for the DC platform for uh, reasons, the top of which are, are cost. Uh, uh, today, these systems are going in uh, at a lower cost than conventional AC systems when you uh, count the uh, control element. And uh, this is why we now have uh, national um, companies that are specifying DC platforms for all of uh, their buildings. So I would say uh, largely uh, lighting and control is uh, in the lead, but there are some other loads in hot pursuit. Uh, this is a picture of our uh, flagship product. It is a, it's a DC power supply that has 16 channels out, and you can get those uh, uh, low voltage channels out in a number of ways. I'm going to be talking about POE, power over Ethernet in a moment. Uh, but um, we've been in the market long enough to have uh, uh, been early and seen its development and are, we're pleased to have attracted the uh, Vision Award from Facilities Net uh, for that microgrid controller that uh, uh, for the most part is replacing the lighting panel in a, uh, in a building, which is part of its value proposition. But 
more about the load. That is really where the action is and where the greatest efficiencies can be picked up in the lighting platform, uh, whether you're doing uh, um, sophisticated daylight emulating fixtures or utility fixtures in a large space. Uh, either way, you can save uh, money by avoiding that, uh, that driver inside the uh, fixture. Uh, many of you may remember the uh, ballast, even the electromagnetic ballast that used to live in all of our fluorescent fixtures. Uh, that uh, has shrunk in the, uh, in the general use of LED systems to a small driver, maybe as big as a deck of cards. And now, uh, certainly in, in our case, we're specifying fixtures that have no driver at all. Uh, this uh, removes that point of failure and also uh, lowers the cost of the fixture, which is a big contributor in making these systems uh, commercially competitive. It's hard to under underestimate the, uh, the value of controls. I think people are generally aware of the rule of thumb that a good control system should lower your uh, operating cost of your lighting system by half. Uh, we found that true. Uh, but also, uh, for us, the excitement is that uh, we can talk to more than one uh, protocol, whether it's wired or wireless. Uh, we can bring it into this uh, DC platform at a lower cost than uh, bringing uh, those technologies into AC systems because uh, they are essentially separate in an AC platform and have to be installed uh, separately and commissioned separately, whereas today we can uh, ride those electronic control systems right on the back of the power, uh, allowing us to uh, install them uh, simultaneously with the power installation for the uh, uh, load that's addressed. Retail stores, uh, grocery stores, clothes stores, they have more uh, monitors and screens uh, everywhere you go. And uh, one of the largest uh, grocery retailers has announced plans to put a uh, four-inch high, four-foot wide uh, video screen, you can see there in the top picture, uh, in all of their stores that would replace the paper shelf tags. This, of course, will give them an incredible advantage in terms of pricing flexibility, where they can control the image on the screen from a central location, uh, avoiding a two-week turnaround for changing paper shelf tags. So it's not just uh, lighting and control. It's not just um, the uh, monitor or screen, but it's the whole integrated database of uh, what these uh, systems support for different kinds of customers. We were happy a couple years ago to get uh, recognized at uh, uh, Neocon, which is the big uh, interior design event uh, held annually in Chicago uh, on account of the work mm -hmm. done by our friends at uh, the Falcon Group. They make sound attenuating panels. And so this is an example of one of these unexpected uh, channel partners that uh, have created a, a new way of embedding lighting and control into uh, sound masking uh, devices or sound attenuating uh, uh, panels. And uh, the creative way they were able to do that attracted them a, a gold award at, at uh, Neocon. Now, I did mention the, uh, the, the DC outlet. If you consider all the different places where you might use that, uh, work comes to mind where you plug in a laptop or a monitor or charge your phone, all of which are looking for a DC input, and that's true. Uh, but one of the exciting applications for the DC outlet that we found is in healthcare, hospitals, and um, uh, health clinics, in that uh, they are generally required by their uh, regulators to have medical grade uh, uh, receptacles in their uh, in all of their locations for a couple of reasons. Uh, one for safety, you want to have that uh, ground fault interrupter uh, embedded in all of the receptacles in a uh, healthcare facility. But also, um, 
uh, for the uh, pull force of the wire coming out of it so that you don't have a cheaply made receptacle or a poorly made mating plug uh, falling out of the wall unexpectedly. So those two elements, which are uh, the key to having a medical grade uh, receptacle, are, uh, are removed by having a DC receptacle that's powered by class two power. And the reason for that is uh, largely safety, uh, class two uh, power levels being below the shock and startle hazard, as well as the fire hazard. They do not require a, a medical rating, and yet they can power a great many things inside of a, a, a patient's hospital room, a doctor's exam room or office, and a regular uh, office and lounge areas in a, a hospital or clinic. So we're seeing a, a real money-saving opportunity in the healthcare industry uh, for the uh, DC receptacle, in addition to uh, office space. Another uh, uh, DC load applications, and I, I tend to spend more time on the load than I do on the distribution method, because um, that is where things can change quickly. Uh, where people are specifying loads, uh, owners of buildings are buying loads every day, trying to come up with more efficient ways to operate. Uh, sometimes that opportunity is embedded in the load, and that is true uh, more and more with network shading systems. You can see uh, this is a, a graphic reflecting uh, shades in an office environment, and um, uh, by having those shades networked and working according to clock and calendar, you can be sure that your building is put to bed at night and not rely on staff to lower those shades. And if you can demonstrate that in a commercial building, you then put yourself in the, uh, in the neighborhood of utility rebates for those consistent energy savings tools deployed in a building. And we're excited to see that happening because uh, it used to be only available in a very expensive uh, platform, and we've uh, demonstrated that we can knock a third or so off the, uh, the price of that network uh, shade solution. What's ahead? This is, a, uh, I think, an interesting graphic that uh, shows uh, a bird's eye view of where a uh, gas Station might be going uh, one day soon. Uh, I'm sure many people look at that canopy that's always over the pumps and think solar. Well, it's not enough, but it is a start. Uh, this is an analysis we did for a convenience store uh, and a gas pump operator of uh, global proportions as they consider how to convert their gas filling stations to DC fast charging fast charging stations for a vehicle. And you can see um, our proposal included a significant amount of battery storage along with the solar and the grid connection. Um, but it also uh, involved shrinking the load. They went from about an eight kilowatt steady state load in that convenience store to uh, just under five kilowatts by uh, converting the loads to DC. That uh, doesn't sound like so much, maybe uh, three kilowatts in uh, load reduction, but if you've got the 20 or 30,000 gas stations, it uh, adds up in your portfolio. We think that that critical interface you can see there between the building and the, uh, the power pole uh, from the grid is where the action will be in managing these more efficient buildings and the grid as they get uh, more efficient on their own, as we introduce uh, on-site DC power to carry that load, uh, it, it raises the specter of being able to export power uh, as alternating current to the grid if you have an excess of it, uh, thanks to your efficiency measures. Likewise, if you're able to uh, bi-directionally connect those DC uh, fast charging vehicles, which uh, are all fast charging vehicles uh, take their charge in a DC format, you have this opportunity to aggregate both power uh, generators and uh, storage uh, holders, uh, elements that can provide 
uh, power back in an emergency. So I think that's a really interesting uh, element in the uh, power systems coming up for us. Quickly to PoE. Um, I, we don't make, uh, my company doesn't make PoE products, but you can't ignore uh, the advent of uh, power over Ethernet to supply uh, small loads. This is true uh, for uh, telephony. We've all seen the telephone handsets that get their power through the Ethernet cable and maybe also the uh, video cameras uh, around commercial buildings that also get their power and share their data that way. But the LED revolution has created opportunities also for the PoE platform in lighting. Uh, there uh, have not been uh, wholesale conversions uh, in locations or customers that we're aware of yet, but there have been some big projects uh, completed, and uh, we think it's an important trend to, to watch. I would say that so far some of the early limitations on that uh, platform is that while the installation is less expensive using low voltage wiring, uh, the costs still have remained high. Uh, the electrical efficiency has not uh, kept a pace with other higher power conversions. And still the big data value, this is the IoT uh, webinar series, that big data value proposition has still uh, not been embraced by a lot of end customers. And so it'll be interesting to see how that uh, comes about. I uh, was, I promised to mention Volt Server, uh, which is an exciting technology from our friends at the company of that name, who uh, can deliver a class one voltage on uh, what is ordinarily considered class two wiring. And I would say if you haven't heard of that, it's worth taking a look at the Volt Server uh, website. And the promise is that they'll be able to, to deliver higher and higher uh, power levels on lighter and lighter infrastructure. And so in that sense, this fits, uh, fits in exactly with uh, my theme in the talk, which is uh, lighter infrastructure is called for because the loads uh, do not demand uh, the same power density. And here's an example of a new technology that is providing um, more power over a uh, lighter infrastructure, which uh, we think is really exciting. That's my uh, cavalcade of adopters uh, around the country. I have three times that many logos. Uh, and so that tells me that there are uh, great opportunities ahead for new entrants in the market, but also for facilities managers, building owners, architects, designers to uh, explore the kind of uh, new freedoms that are available by going this route. I believe that's about my time allotted. I appreciate the opportunity to share this with you, and you'd be welcome to find me behind that uh, email address. That's Paul Savage at nexttechpower.com. Thank you. Paul, there was Thank a couple you. of questions uh, that, that came along. Um, one was the Ford building that you mentioned. Um, the question is, where was that? or what building is that? Uh, sorry, which uh, the the Ford building in the picture? Yeah, or well, the one There's, that you mentioned. Uh, I think. Uh, well, uh, I talked about the AGU building, uh, which is the American Geophysical Union. Uh, that's at 200 Florida Avenue in Washington, or 2000 rather, Florida Avenue in Washington D.C. The Ford building were in there. Uh, Michigan Assembly Plant here, I believe that's a rendering of a uh, Ford plant in Thailand where we're installed. Okay, another question was about um, what about the regulatory or regulation of rates and fees regarding DC microgrids? And I think I'll take that one um, and just answer that the, the regulatory apparatus that um, uh, governs uh, fees and, and uh, prices and so on, uh, rates uh, of electricity, really has less to do with uh, the type of electricity, whether it's AC or DC, but has to do with where that electricity system is being used. So typically inside buildings, it's what they call behind the meter, which means that it's unregulated um, 
by at least by utility regulation or by uh, uh, regulatory law in that domain. You still have commercial laws, and of course you have electrical municipal codes and so on that you're familiar with, um, and and business codes that uh, you know consumer protection and all that uh, apparatus to protect uh, behind the meter stuff. I think the the coming um, discussion, and it's already started, is what happens when you cross uh, property lines and uh, start to infringe on the rules that were granted to many utilities as, as being natural monopolies. Um, and that's being hashed out almost on a state-by-state, -state, municipality by municipality basis. Um, some of the more aggressive uh, states with regard to uh, uh, looking at deregulation or re-regulation are uh, states like California, New York, uh, New Jersey, and uh, Maryland, and so on. Um, but other states are wrestling with the same question as the whole paradigm of uh, power and communications changes. Um, you know, what do you, what, how does the regulatory system need to address that? Um, so we're likely to see uh, almost as much innovation required in that domain as we do in the technology domain for what's going on. Um, so regulatory-wise, um, you know, AC and DC don't make a difference. It really has to do with, uh, you know, the, the territory and, and the, and the uh, uh, granting of monopolies. And I, I see a couple here I can answer for Kyle uh, Muleg. The, uh, the amount of power that uh, fast charging stations are looking for is uh, uh, changing very, very rapidly. Just a year ago, you could confidently confidently say 50 kilowatts would get you there, and now there are uh, companies in Europe providing single connectors for the fast charging of vehicles capable of 300 kilowatts at a clip. So I think uh, before the uh, mass deployment of these kind of technologies uh, gets to where it's really replacing gas, um, that that number uh, is not mm. set, but you could probably assume 100 kilowatts per connection is, uh, would be a good place to start. We also had from uh, Manjot, Kandura, what are the other alternatives to DC lighting sources in addition to PoE? I'd say that there's a great many companies out there with non-conforming PoE-like systems that are using structured cabling. And so uh, I would expect to see more and more of uh, PoE-like uh, lighting systems in the market uh, place, although uh, we think a conventional two-conductor 12-gauge system actually gets you a greater value at a lower cost. And one other thing, Christine Gibney uh, from the American Geophysical Union, thank you, Christine, for uh, uh, piping up, and she points out that they are providing uh, net zero uh, walking tours of the building at uh, 2000 Florida Avenue in Washington, D.C., Mondays 12 to 3 and Wednesdays 11 to 1. And you can uh, schedule a private tour by contacting her at netzerotours at agu.org. Thank you, Christine. Uh, and, Paul, I think it's important to point out or reemphasize the fact that with the proliferation of sensor technology and other devices that are being actuated, whether it's cameras and um, uh, things that are providing what, what people are calling um, modified or enhanced reality environments and so on and so forth, that this articulation uh, using electrical devices really begs the, the question of how do we get uh, wiring to reach all these devices and so on. Um, uh, some of the solutions obviously can turn to wireless if they're portable devices and can, you know, sit down in, in, in some uh, uh, place where it can get a, a wireless charge. But the, the whole notion of a lighter gauge wiring system with smaller, maybe even more prolific uh, uh, outlets um, really is important. Uh, the picture that you show to your mother-in-law's kitchen um, is, is a fraction of what you'd see in my house. Um, I sometimes have two six or eight outlet plug strips in addition to the splitters. <laughs> if you went into my office, my home office, you know, where I have, uh, you know, three or four printers and I got m multiple screens and all kinds of devices, 
um, you know, the, the way the house, my home, which is where my office is, uh, was wired is just inadequate. The other question that was asked with that regard is uh, the question of, is this all okay with the NEC, the electrical code? And I, I'm, I'm happy to say that right from the get-go, and this started uh, a good eight or almost ten years ago now, we uh, worked with the uh, NFPA and, and uh, with the UL and NEMA and others uh, to get a lot of the early code um, uh, uh, corrected or expanded or, uh, or at least redefined, because in most cases it really didn't change the basic requirements for safety, uh, but it was hard to interpret a lot of what was in the NEC um, because it was it was written you know with AC in mind. So there is there was some interpretation that had to be done, but a lot of the code now has been expanded uh, to include DC. Um, so that that applies to you know these lighting circuits and and a, and a bunch of other things where you have touch safe particularly where you go to class two. There's a lot of defini definition in there for class two. And of course, class one uh, has to follow the same rules of class one. If it's de designated as class one wiring, then it's class one wiring and, uh, and not much changes. So uh, I hope that helps uh, answer that. And I know that some of the early installations, uh, very often a, a local inspector would, uh, would call up and ask about things. Um, but there's been quite a bit of training that's been going on at the IBEW and, and NECA and so on, uh, with the help of NEMA and others and eMERGE, uh, to keep keep uh, you know people up to speed on what's going on. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you so much, Brian and Paul. Uh, I think it was a great presentation. Um, if you uh, like, I said earlier, you know the the recording will be posted on our website at www.iotnowwebinars.org. It does take about a week for us to post it. Um, so if you have any questions uh, during that, please feel free to email it to me directly, or uh, you know Brian and Paul's information will be shared as well. Our next webinar is going to be in December. The topic is electromagnetic compatibility. Uh, the date has uh, is, is still to be announced. It will be announced on our web on our website at uh, again at iotnowwebinars.org. Um, so um, thank you, everyone, and thank you to the presenters, uh, Paul and Brian. Thank you for the you're, opportunity. You're, you're very welcome. Uh, Mohammed, do you want me to say anything about these last two questions, or is our time over? Uh, sure. I mean, if we have, if we still have uh, one more question, yeah. then uh, sure, go ahead I, and answer. I, I, I think we have one and a half questions. I, I believe I answered Manjot's about alternatives to DC. Uh, lighting in addition to POE, and so we're just left with Brian Holland's uh, question, will DC generation and supply ever exceed AC generation and supply? Well, in that sense, it already does uh, because of the uh, solar gain daily on the Earth. Uh, the question is, what are we uh, going to do about it? Um, <clears throat> the uh, critical issue for, for, for me or for our company as we look at uh, the opportunity is, what is the load and, and how do we how do we best support it? And that has uh, taken us to these uh, DC platforms. But I think um, how we uh, turn our energy sources, whether it's uh, fossil or the sun or the wind, uh, we have the opportunity to go uh, direct DC, and that has uh, provided benefits to uh, many and it's a growing group. I thought I'd like to also tie in the uh, the simile that um, I always use because I, I kind of grew up more in the uh, uh, information and communications world as opposed to the power world. Um, but for the most part, uh, people might remember that when data was first uh, uh, starting to be communicated from personal computers and across networks, uh, in order to use the uh, telephone lines, which were the only means, the uh, I'll call it the... Um, uh, the uh, uh, central means of uh, tying things together, uh, you had to com convert to acoustical, through acu acoustical modems to acoustical tones uh, because the circuits were acoustical. So if you draw the simile uh, to electricity, right now our bulk system, our main system, backbone system, the grid, is an AC system. But you could easily make the argument, particularly in buildings, that uh, the, a majority of the load is moving directly toward DC, if not already there. I think there was a recent study at Virginia Tech that said 
a modern office building is like 70% natively DC now. Um, and if you move to things like variable speed motors and, and uh, even induction cooking and things like that, which are technically AC technologies, they require to be front-ended by DC, which means you have, uh, in those cases today, you have triple conversions going on, AC to DC back to AC, uh, you know, not, not a fixed frequency. Um, so the, the uh, argument perhaps is how fast um, can we modify the way we um, utilize the bulk system, which is AC, in combination with the DC system that eventually we think will be the majority case in buildings. Um, and that's a, that's a question that uh, I think everybody is asking, but if we again go back to what happened in telecommunications world and the data communications world, uh, once that uh, iceberg was broken or that ice was broken there, uh, it was pretty rapid. So it could be you know, less, than a gener less than a decade, uh, perhaps as much as three decades, I would say. Uh, it, it, some would argue the Internet took four decades. But I think with the help of the Internet and the IoT explosion, we're probably looking more at one to two decades tops. Sure. Uh, well, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul and Brian. That was, uh, I, uh, that was a great presentation. We have been receiving a lot of uh, good remarks already. So uh, we hope you join us for the next webinar in December for EMC. And uh, again, uh, thank you for everybody joining the webinar today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.